Good morning and welcome to our morning service at Barmer Baptist Church. If you have forgotten to uh, change your clocks by an hour, you're probably watching this an hour uh, later than you should be. But uh, nonetheless, it's good to have you with us. And uh, at least you're not going to walk into the building uh, and get noticed that you're an hour late. But uh, thank you so much for taking this time to watch this uh, video this morning. And we hope that you're encouraged as you spend this time with us. Paul writes these words to, to Timothy, his, his younger uh, men, uh, trainee in the faith. He says to him, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This saying is true and it can be trusted. I was the worst sinner of all, but since I was worse than anyone else, God had mercy on me and let me be an example of the endless patience of Christ Jesus. He did this so that others would put their faith in Christ and have eternal life. I pray that honour and glory will always be given to the only God who lives forever and is the invisible and eternal King. Amen. We're going to sing our opening hymn, And Can It Be That I Should Gain an Interest in the Saviour's Blood. Should start 
We're going to come as our prayer now. We're going to pray for ourselves. We're going to pray for the churches around us in this community and for our Baptist family, particularly our Eastern Baptist Association, for the churches here in the city of Cambridge and uh, that we're connected to. And this week as part of our prayer call, as part, part of the Eastern Baptist Association, we're praying for the church in Thetford, Formalston Baptist Church. They have a community community minister Tim Lovejoy and uh, they're doing a lot of good work in a very difficult and challenging community there in Thetford. They're asking us to pray for them as they move through this time. They've, they've managed to open up the church again on Sundays. They are doing a lot of good work with some of those community groups. They've had some folks join them as a result of all the initiatives they've been doing through lockdown. So they're asking us to pray, as you say here, as you can see, for, for members, three members of the fellowship who are struggling with life's challenges and for whom this period of social isolation has not been good news. Exciting ideas for Christmas that will need wisdom as they proceed creatively and safely, and wisdom and creativity as they seek ways to keep in touch with those support they are supporting in their community. So they're asking us to pray. A lot of these things are very similar to a lot of the churches in our association, and even with ourselves as well. So, But let's come to God in prayer, shall we? Father God, we thank you that we come to you this morning confident of your grace for us and of your mercy that you show up and shower us with lord like with paul we we can echo there's just the amazing grace that you have given to us the, the mercy that you have poured out upon us and we thank you that we are able to celebrate your goodness to us we thank you for all that you accomplished for us in christ jesus and father god we thank you so much for that we pray that as we spend this time together this morning you'd encourage our hearts strengthen our faith uh, just meet us, we pray. Where we're struggling, encourage us and comfort us. Where we are encouraged, um, add to that, we pray. May we be blessed as we worship you and spend this time with you. We pray that for ourselves, but we also pray for our brothers and sisters in this community, for the folk at Fenditon Parish Church, those at St Vincent de Paul, at Christ Redeemer, at City Church and Christ Church. We thank you too for our partnership uh, in the gospel with our Baptist family. We thank you for the support and encouragement we receive from them and for being able to partner with them both in this city and across this, this area. We pray for the local churches around us, but we also pray for our Baptist family in this association, for our team of regional team of, of Beth and Graham and Nick and Haley. And we pray for Formalston Baptist Church today. We pray for the, the community minister, Tim, that you'd encourage him as he seeks to lead and encourage that church in its community engage, engagement. Thank you for these, uh, the, the encouragements they have seen as they have regathered after to, to the lockdown period. We pray for those particularly struggling uh, who are finding things really difficult um, at this time. Lord, we pray that you give them comfort and strength and give wisdom to the team as they support them. For plans for Christmas and going forward from this, Lord, we pray that you would continue to lead and direct. Give them wisdom, we pray, and an understanding of what is your heart and will for them as a church, as they seek to serve in that community. So pour out your blessing upon them, we pray. And for ourselves again, we give you our thanks. We offer you our worship and we offer our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. We're now going to sing uh, the, the song, Here I Am, Majesty, as we worship our God, as we bring ourselves into his presence to, to, and recognise we're in his presence to worship him uh, and declare his praise.
just usual notices for our church family. So just to remind you that we meet for, for coffee, uh, virtual coffee after this. So please do join us for that. Uh, we've got a prayer meeting tomorrow morning and we've got small groups this week on Wednesday and Thursday. And just to, again, all of those are on Zoom, all those are online. Please get in touch if you want the links for any of those things and we will happily send them to you. But uh, do please do keep in touch and keep in touch with our website because the information is there about what's happening as we go forward. We're going to pray now. We're going to continue to pray for our nation for our, uh, as we sort of, this, this second spike kind of really takes hold. Pray for uh, those who are having to make decisions, for those communities particularly that are affected by this. We're also going to pray for our world, and obviously we're, we're very much mindful of the, ele- uh, the presidential election in the United States that was happening next week, and a significant uh, decision that the, the, those, that countries have to make, uh, and that has an impact upon the whole world in terms of who is the president in that, in that country. So we're going to pray for that nation as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can come to you in prayer. Thank you that we know that you hear our prayers and that, Lord, they matter to you. And, Lord, we come in, in and stand in the gap for our nation at this time again. Lord, you know and ev- understand everything about what's going on. We ask, Heavenly Father, for your grace upon us, for your mercy upon us. We pray for your, for your power to be at work. We pray for your wisdom to be given to those who have to make decisions. Lord, we pray for sustaining grace upon those on the front line, those who have been giving uh, of themselves week in, week out, day in, day out, throughout this period, and again now facing another, another uh, spike in the numbers. Lord God, we pray. We pray, Father God, for your, uh, your mercy upon our nation, not just our nation, but our world. And we pray, Father God, for, for all those across the world who have to make decisions, that, Lord God, uh, the, the right decisions will be taken at the right time in the right way. We pray for those particularly who are finding this period very difficult, for those who are on their own, for those who are struggling with all kinds of different challenges. We ask, Lord God, that you would be gracious to them and be comforting them at this time. Pray for those experiencing loss at this time and some of those we know about Lord, we pray that uh, you would bring comfort to those people as they grieve. Father God, we thank you that you are a God of infinite compassion and grace. And we cry out to you for our nation. As we were reminded last week, Lord, we, we want to come to you. We want to cry out to you. We want to seek your forgiveness and ask that you heal our land. For your glory, we pray. And so, Lord, we want to pray again for our brothers and sisters across uh, the, the, the sea in, in America. And we ask, Lord God, that you would guide that nation as they make these uh, decisions around the president. Lord, we, we, we are asked that you would indeed guide and lead. We pray for our brothers and sisters in that nation, that uh, they would stand up for integrity and truth, that you would protect them from backbiting and from uh, point- finger-pointing. We pray, Lord God, that they would be marked out as men of of peace, men and women of peace. So, Lord, we do pray that you would indeed guide that nation at this time because we know that it has a a massive impact upon the whole world, such such a significant nation. So be at work, we pray. And so, Lord, we thank you that we can offer our prayers and we do so in and through Jesus' name. Amen. Just before we open God's word, we're going to sing together the song, Speak, O Lord, as we make this a prayer that God would speak to us through his word and challenge us and shape us more into his likeness.
Last week we opened our studies in the book of Ruth, in this short little book, and we looked at the opening five verses of chapter one, which were very factual verses. There's no... Um, there's nothing kind of apart from making statements of fact in that and yet with some careful digging and, and by looking at the rest of scripture we were able to draw some, some understanding of, of what happened and what was going on the choices that Elimelech made with his family and the impact for us today the challenge for us today about how we choose to live our lives how we choose to respond to tough times and difficult times Today we come to the main character of the book. We, we, we discover and meet Ruth for the first time. And we see her and her mother-in-law, Naomi, engaging in dialogue. And we start to understand a little bit more then of what they're doing, what they're going through, and how they respond to the experiences they are shaping. We're going to read then from verse 6 of, of Ruth chapter 1. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness, as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them and goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely. If even death separates you and me. When Naomi realised that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on their way until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as this barley harvest was beginning. I've entitled this, uh, this uh, sermon Relocation because it's a significant uh, change in circumstances as we'll see a little bit later just want to make four I've broken this sort of section into four uh, four areas four points I want to make as we work through this chapter or this section together the first of it is this in verses six and seven we have a recognition of God's provision Naomi has been away from Bethlehem for a number of years we don't know exactly how many uh, all we know is that after arriving in Moab uh, sometime after that, her husband Elimelech died. Sometime after that, the two sons, uh, Marlon and Killian, married. And then 10 years after that, they both passed away. Now, it's unlikely all of those things happened in a very short space of time. So it's unlikely, it w it's likely that it was a, a lot longer than just the 10 years. But she was away for a significant period of time. But she still felt Bethlehem was home because it says here that she was going to go home to, to Bethlehem. 
And when Naomi heard reports of what was happening in Bethlehem, she recognised that this was the Lord's provision. This was the provision of Yahweh, her God. Despite being away from Moab for this period of time, she was spiritually aware enough to recognise God's hand at work in Bethlehem. We don't know whether her decision to go back to Bethlehem was triggered by you know, perhaps a, you know, a desire for food or for other things. We don't know why she decided to go back. It seems likely, uh, in the context as we read it, that actually the draw was to go home, to go back to her people, to go back to those people who shared her faith. It seems as we read through this chapter that her faith was real and she recognised in her own self that she was wanting to go back to worshipping Yahweh rather than being amongst the Moabites who were worshipping a whole bunch of other gods. Now, we don't know, again, some of the detail. The reason that why they went to Moab in the first place probably was a Limelech's decision, probably as Naomi, she didn't get, as a wife in that context, she didn't get a lot of say in that matter. She just had to follow on behind. Maybe as the events unfolded in Moab and she lost her husband and then her sons, there was a recognition, and we don't know, again, the context and how that happened. But maybe she saw something of, you know, of, of God's, judgment potentially on their decision to walk away from uh, Bethlehem from worshipping and run to, to worshipping in, other God, in, other, in another place. We don't know whether Naomi's faith had remained strong throughout this 10 plus years while she's been away. What we do know and what seems to be important and the point that the, the writer wants us to understand is that at this point Naomi trusted in God. Whether she'd done that throughout this whole period or not, we, we don't know. But whatever it was, whatever it brought her to this point, she was putting her trust back in God. The journey back to Bethlehem was not to be taken lightly. It was not an easy journey. It was 50 miles as we saw last week. It would have been rough, rugged terrain. There was just the three ladies. They might have had a few extras you know, as part of the group, but they wouldn't have had, been, had a large, large entourage. They wouldn't have had a lot of servants to support them. That would have all disappeared with the death of the, of the men. So it may just have been the three of them travelling alone back to Bethlehem. So whatever it was, whether Naomi acknowledged the mistakes that had been made in the past, we don't know. But she recognised God's provision. She recognised that God was at work in Bethlehem. And she wanted to go back home. She wanted to go back to that place where she could worship again. And so she made the decision to return. And Orpah and Ruth went with her. And as you move on, we then discover Naomi placing a request to God for God's protection. You see, in Jewish law, if a man died, his brother was required to take on his sister-in-law as his own wife and to care for her and her family. That was what happened. So in this case, if, if just Marlon had died, in Jewish law, it would have been Killian's responsibility to take on Orpah as his own. But Naomi, Orpah and Ruth were all widowed now. There was no male relative in Moab that was going to help them. Now we don't know whether the same law applied in Moab as it did in Israel. It would be my understanding and my view that it's unlikely to have done because as I read scripture, it seems that what God sets out in terms of his instructions of his people went way beyond that of the nations around the way that he, he asked them to care for the widow and the, the orphan and the foreigner went way beyond what other nations were doing. So it was unlikely, in my estimation, in my guess, estimation that, um, and my assumptions that they would have, the Moabites would have treated this family, that these ladies, the same. And maybe that was part of the reason why Naomi realised that she would have been better off back with Bethlehem with her own people. Orpah and Ruth, out of their love and commitment to Naomi, travel with her. They, they express their commitment and uh, Naomi thanks them for their kindness. And as they travel, Naomi, recognising the commitment that these girls are making to her, wants to look after them. She wants to bless them. She wants their future, their best. And so she urges them to return to their own communities, to their own families, to the places where they can be supported and cared for. And in saying that, she seeks God's blessing upon them. She said, may the Lord give you, may the Lord bless you, may the Lord keep you. There's, there's lots of instructions in there about what she's asking God to do for these, 
women in the midst of her own pain and sorrow. Her desire is that these daughters-in-law of her who have cared for her through the loss of her sons, their husbands, her love of them is that she wants their best. She recognises that for them perhaps to be cared for the, the most effectively, that might be amongst their own people. She doesn't want their commitment to her to stand in the way of them finding a home for themselves, finding family, finding another husband for themselves. And so she encourages them and urges them to, to go away and to go back to their home. Now again, it could be argued that Naomi takes matters into her own, own hands by urging them to leave her. You know, when you look ahead and you see how it works out for Ruth and Naomi, God is clearly at work and God clearly does something in Ruth's life in preparing this answer to the prayers in the future. But whether, whether that is true or not, that isn't seem, doesn't seem to be the point that the writer wants us to understand here. What the writer wants us to understand is that Naomi is acting in a selfless way. She's putting the interests of her daughters-in-law first. She's seeking God's blessing upon them as she encourages them to, to leave her to go back to their own communities and their own families. She cries out to her God, who she puts her trust in, to ask blessing upon these daughters-in-law of her. Then we have a response to Naomi's faith in these next four verses. You know, last week we saw that Elimelech, when faced with a famine, made the decision to run from God, to run from his people and to flee to Moab. He took matters into his own hands. He made his own decisions. He didn't hang around and trust God to provide for his family. And in Naomi, we see some similarities in that experience. But we also have a very different outcome. She clearly identifies her suffering as a result of God's hand turning against her in verse 13. She says it, doesn't she? It's more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. She sees her loss as a direct consequence of God's hand being against her. And that comes again out in verses 20 and 21 when she's talking to the women back in Bethlehem. She's hurt. She's angry. She's bitter towards God whom she blames directly for the loss of her husband and her sons. We don't know whether Elimelech was blaming God for why his family were going hungry, but it's likely that's part of the reason why he fled from Bethlehem. Now, whether she directly blamed God for, for intervention in, in taking her husband and son's lives, we don't know, or whether she blamed God for allowing it to happen, again, the, the, the passage is not clear on that. Whatever it is, the point that she's making and the point the writer wants us to understand is that for Naomi, she is holding God responsible and accountable for the pain that she is experiencing. But whereas Elimelech, when he faced up to that pain, that anger that he felt towards God, that feeling of being let down, ran away from God, Naomi has a different outcome. She recognises God's hand is, is still upon her, still at work. And so rather than running from God, she presses into God. Rather than leaving God, she wants to go back to where God's people are, goes back, wants to go back to worshipping Yahweh. She chooses to return rather than run. And in the context of that, we have this most remarkable response from Ruth to what she witnesses in her mother-in-law. You know, if we had a, 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 this, this section in our Bibles, and verse 16 and 17 didn't exist. It was a blank section. And we read the rest of that chapter, the rest of that, that section, and then we're asked to fill in what happened in verses 16 and 17 and how Ruth would respond. I very much doubt that we'd write what Ruth actually said. Because the way that we read what Naomi says doesn't seem to inspire us into following God. But what happens is, and what Ruth says is this, it's quite remarkable. When, where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Naomi's response to what she's going through, Naomi's response to her, her pain and anger, inspires Ruth to put her trust in 
Naomi's God. And that is amazing. It's not what we would understand from happening from this passage when we read it. So there are some similarities between Elimelech and Naomi, this, this sense of anger towards God, this bitterness they feel, this, this hurt they feel. But whereas Elimelech runs, Naomi presses into God, she comes back to God, she turns back to God. She hangs on to God, she clings on to God. And Ruth sees that. And Ruth recognises that and Ruth chooses that God. The faith of Naomi, a real and a rugged faith, a faith that has the strength to be brutally honest with God and yet cling to him in the pain that she feels, leads Ruth to respond by giving herself to follow Yahweh, to leave behind the worship of her own gods and of her people. There's a real challenge for us in our faith, isn't it, as we follow God. Sometimes as Christians we can become almost scared of being honest, scared of actually being able to, to tell God exactly how we feel, what we're going through. But we're not kidding any, we're not kidding God, we're only kidding ourselves because God knows anyway. <laughs> he sees our heart, he understands what we're feeling. So if you feel anger and, bit, and bitterness and, and hurt towards God, he sees it, he knows it. So you might as well own those feelings and own that emotion and experience. But in doing so, we need to recognise too the, the difference between Elimelech and Naomi and the outcomes for them both. In the midst of our honesty, we need to press into God. We need to come close to God and cling on to him, not run from him. Now, there's going to be times in our lives where we suffer. There's going to be times in our lives where things are difficult. Sometimes it's because of our actions and the consequences of our decisions. Sometimes it's going to be because of stuff that happens to us. But in those moments of pain, in those moments of anger and hurt, when we're struggling, we have a choice. Do we choose like Elimelech to run? Or do we choose like Naomi to hang on and to cling on to God and to press into God? Even though we feel that he's responsible for it. But we recognise he is uh, the, the God of grace and love. When we choose to press in, when we choose to hang on to God, Despite all that's going on, it will be noted, it will be seen, it will be it. people around us will see it and evidence it. And people will be drawn to that God, drawn to our God, because of our faith and our trust in him. The last section I've entitled, A Return to God's People. Naomi realises that Ruth is totally committed to her. The word that is used in verse 14 to, of of Ruth here that she clings to Naomi that word cling carries a sense of faithful commitment it's a cleaving it's a hanging on to it's the word that is used in the Garden of Eden to describe a man and a woman cleaving to, to one another that's the kind of relationship that's the kind of emphasis of this word here and Naomi recognises in Ruth that she's, she's kind of choosing this path for herself and so she allows her to follow with her so they continue on their journey back to, to Bethlehem and they arrive there. It's like they arrive when the barley harvest is, is underway, which is what, what it says in verse 22, which is why the men are out in the field harvesting and the women are, are there to greet them. And as they walk in to Bethlehem, what we need to recognise at this point is that at this moment, everything is new for Ruth. Everything is new for Ruth. She's never been to Bethlehem before. She's never been to Judah before. She's got a new group of people around her with new lots of customs. She may well have learnt Hebrew through her being in part of the family. We don't know. But there was a new language for her to learn. New culture, new traditions, new understanding, new worship rituals and understandings of how you worshipped. Everything for Ruth was new. And we sometimes miss that in the context of this. But you know, when we're struggling... We need to recognise as we read Ruth that she was in that place. She was a, a complete outsider coming into a completely different context. And we need to hold on to that thought as we read through the rest of this little book. 
She has on the journey expressed her commitment to God in no uncertain terms. She has said, you know, your people will be my people and your God will be my God. In these verses, again, we find, as we've done in, in the Old Testament, in our look at, look at recently in our recent studies, the significance of names. Don't call me Naomi. Naomi says to those women in Bethlehem, she told them, call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. We have the word Naomi, the name Naomi, which means pleasant. And she says, no, that's not my life anymore. My life is bitter. Call me Mara. But what is really significant in this section is not that, it's what she calls God and how she refers to God. She refers to God as the Almighty. That word is Shaddai. One commentator describes that word, as that, that name of God, as the God who is at his best when man is at his worst. This name Almighty captures something of this incredible God who blesses when everything else around us is rubbish. So in calling God Shaddai, Naomi is again expressing her faith that her God is a God who blesses. Even though she experiences, has, has experienced bitterness, even though she points out to, to the, 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 the ladies that she went away full and has come back empty, she is affirming her faith in the God who blesses and who honours It's as if she's saying, while you can see my pain, while you can see what I'm going through, while you can see clearly the out, out workings of this, I don't understand why, I don't know why, but God is still a good God. He is still a God who wants to bless and, and give blessing. And I want to trust him, and I do trust him. You know, as we finish... There will be times in our lives where we make choices that lead us to experiences and, and we have changes in our circumstances. Things happen to us. We might move. We might have to face a new job, live into new, moving into a new area, moving to a new church. All kinds of things that can happen to us. For our young people going off to university, experiencing a new culture, and then what happens post-university? Do they come back to Cambridge or do they, they relocate elsewhere? Lots of change that happens in our lives. And some of that stuff is deliberate because it's, it's our choices. Some of it is just circumstantial, happens to us. Sometimes things happen to us because we make choices. Things don't quite go to plan and sometimes that's because of us, sometimes that's because of things outside of our control, as we saw last week. The title of this sermon series is Trust in Times of Turmoil. We experience those times in our lives where we feel all over the place. We don't quite know, there's, there's no sense of, of security perhaps in our lives, nothing's really kind of confident. Uh, we're not sure of where anything, where our footing is. The th things around us, the circumstances around us are shifting all the time. And yet in the midst of all of that, the challenge of this story is that we can trust God. Naomi teaches us that even when we're experiencing pain and anger in our relationship with God, in the uncertainty of relocating to a new area, back to her home, but bearing in mind she's been away for 10 plus years, Ruth's never been there in that moment of relocating, of moving there. God was still in control. And she could still trust in him. Rather than blame him, she pushed herself, she presses in. Rather than run away, she comes close, she clings on. In her honesty, she demonstrates that integrity of both being able to be honest about her, her, her struggles, but coming and hanging on to God. Because ultimately she recognises he is the Lord Almighty, El Shaddai. He is the one that is unchanging. He is the God who wants to bless. He is the God who gives when others would stop giving. He is the God of grace. This is the Lord, the Lord Almighty. He can be and should be trusted. 
I hope and pray that whatever your circumstances this morning, however tumultuous your life may feel, however uncertain tomorrow may look for you, rather than run from God, that you will run to God, you will cling to him and recognise that he is the Lord Almighty. He is El Shaddai. He is the God who wants to bless you. We're going to sing our final song. Uh, Cornerstone, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. It's a song which reminds us that our, our confidence is not based on circumstances. It's based on our relationship with him. It's based on the fact that he is God Almighty, El Shaddai. blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus name my hope is built on nothing less in Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly trust in Jesus' name Christ alone, cornerstone Weak made strong Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of
close with saying the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Can I thank you for joining with us this morning? If you'd like someone to pray with you, please get in touch. You can email the office, you can phone me. Um, you know, if you're in the area and you can pop in, ring first. But if I'm around, pop in and, and be a privilege to pray for you. We can do all the socially distant stuff and do it properly and do it carefully. But if you need someone to talk to, please don't avoid getting in touch. We're here to support you. We're here to encourage you. We're here to provide resources for you. I pray that you'll be encouraged. Hang on to God as you go into this week with all its uncertainties, knowing that God is sovereign. He is in control. He is El Shaddai, the Lord Almighty. God bless.